Hey, yo, is this thing on? Birds, babies, and bedtime. Test seven, Rutherford Biology. Welcome to the lab. We are going to be learning about my alliterative test seven unit, birds, babies, and bedtime, where we'll talk about birds making babies and how that has to do with bedtime. So we have chickens. Chickens lay eggs. What are eggs? Eggs are haploid gametes. A gamete is just an egg or a sperm. It is a cell with half a set of DNA intended for sexual reproduction, fertilization, to create the zygote. The zygote, the first diploid cell of all organisms that is going to go through mitosis and mitosis and mitosis to make lots of diploid normal cells and then eventually be born as a baby chick or a baby male if you come from a fetus. Now. Let's zoom back to the original. We have birds. Birds lay the egg. What is in the egg? The egg has tons of nutrients, both macronutrients, micronutrients, our macronutrients being proteins, fats, aka lipids, nucleic acids, and carbs. Now, she doesn't put too many carbs in there because fats is a really great energy source. And so that's why in your egg, there's tons of incredible nutrition, your micronutrients, vitamins and minerals, as well as your macronutrients, nucleic acids to make your DNA and your RNA and your fats for energy. And that's what the yolk is primarily and tons of protein because proteins are what we operate on. Proteins give you your phenotype, your physical appearance. They are made of amino acids. So there's gonna be tons of amino acids in that egg and proteins are working things when they are called enzymes that end in ACE and proteins are structural things. This is all, this is all some review stuff here. So we need to be able to make the DNA, which is the instructions for the proteins, the mRNA, which is the temporary instructions for the proteins. So we can transcribe and translate that into proteins, which give us our phenotypes, our physical appearances and whatnot. Okay. So mama needs to mama chicken needs to go through meiosis in her ovaries so that she can make haploid gametes, those eggs, and 39 chromosomes for a chicken, 23 chromosomes for a human, that's gonna be haploid. That means you have one of each, one of each. Now, why is mom putting only half a set of DNA in that haploid gamete? Because she's waiting for fertilization from the rooster. And that sperm is also haploid, a haploid gamete, which came from meiosis from the male, a rooster. And this male rooster goes through meiosis to make a bunch of sperm and then fertilization to our zygote there. It is at that point that all of these nutrients can be consumed with this mitosis, just splitting from two to four to eight, 16, 12, you know, 36, whatever. Okay. Not doing the math right right now, but the biology is that you get a lot of cells, more and more cells. The first step is called a blastocyst where you have these cells around the outside and a cluster in the middle. The outside cells are going to be supporting the inside cells. The inside cells are going to become the actual organism. So these stem cells are totally powerful. They're all powerful stem cells that are going to become every single cell in the chicken, nervous system, digestive system, skin, feathers, you know, like everything. And what are cells made of? Cells are made of proteins, lipids, carbs, and nucleic acids. And therefore mama, chicken has to put a ton of that into there. Now, if there is no rooster and there is no sperm, then that egg just gets shot out when mama chicken ovulates. And that egg is just got a bunch of nutrients there. Okay. Which we get to generously borrow from the chicken and say, thank you, mama chicken for going through your natural processes. This will nourish my body. You will then take those nutrients, the micro and macronutrients, and you will incorporate that into your DNA, your RNA, your proteins as a human being. You could just rearrange the amino acids. So you turn into human cells rather than chicken cells. Okay. Now, <clears throat> getting to a baby or a baby chick. The cool thing about chickens is that chickens are the only other thing other than mammals that go through REM sleep. Birds, not just chickens, birds go through REM deep dreaming, creative sleep. Now this offers some interesting connections with evolution because as humans, we have this prefrontal cortex 
which is right up here in the forehead here, which has been added on to our central lizard brain. Now, in the basic center of our brain, we have the brain stem, which takes care of like heart rate and breathing. And then we come up into more basic things like the hippocampus, which takes memories from the day, carries them in the short term. And then when you sleep, the non-REM sleep is going to spread those memories out. Every animal needs to be able to do that. Every animal is getting your non-REM sleep. That's non-rapid eye movement sleep for learning and memory. Taking the hippocampus stuff, sorting it out, just like when you come home, you got a bunch of groceries, you got to sort them throughout the pantry. Or the librarian has a bunch of books and she's got to sort them all throughout the library. The sorting happens during non-REM sleep. That's the first stage of sleep when you go to sleep. And quick power naps, 20 minutes or whatnot, can actually clear that hippocampus so that you can then learn some more stuff and we'll sort those memories. It's really good for learning a memory. That's just basic part of being an animal. The other parts of basic being an animal is having emotions. Emotions, fear, um, stress, like, you know, hunger, like whatever. All your emotions are controlled by the amygdala and another area called the limbic system, but we'll simplify it to the amygdala. The amygdala right here, again, very central, okay? And right there next to memory, which is why you remember things that are emotional much better. And if you're excited for something, you're excited, you're interested in learning something, it's so much easier to learn because your amygdala is literally right next to your hippocampus for memory. Now, the hypothalamus controls your sleep. Now, every animal sleeps, sleep is essential, and so it is also very centrally located in the brain, just above the brainstem, we call this area the midbrain, okay? And so your hypothalamus controls your sleep cycle. We call the sleep cycle circadian rhythm. And that is involved with releasing your nighttime hormone melatonin, which tells you to calm down, relax, and go to sleep. And that's signaled by watching the sunset and seeing red lights. And it is not signaled by watching something crazy on your phone or like staring into the bright blue light of your phone or watching some you know, drama or whatever on television. That will get you stressed out, release your cortisol, and that's waking up stuff. So if you're doing that 11 p.m., it's gonna be very hard for your hypothalamus to set your circadian rhythm and that's another reason why it's very important to go to bed at the same time, wake up at the same time, go to bed at the same time, wake up at the same time, so your body knows what to do. When to release cortisol and be awake and bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, ready to learn, and when to go to sleep. Give yourself that balanced relaxation where you can learn things and memorize things. And then our last part of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, that is the part that lights up in the later stages of sleep called REM sleep. Or REM sleep is really where we make these crazy creative connections. This is your emotional therapist, your best therapist, your problem solving. You know when you sleep well, you, are, you have better relationships, you are more patient, you have cool inventive ideas. Inventors throughout history have been able to use REM sleep to create interesting connections and you dream about this and that and what you dream about is this weird concoction of stuff that is your prefrontal cortex playing with all areas of your brain and emotions and trying to sort that out and figure it out and see what connects and see what you can do and that is something that mammals share with birds as well that REM sleep okay so it's a very special thing that's evolved and this is where you get paralyzed now, mammals, specifically um, mammals that sleep on the ground and birds that sleep in nests, REM sleep will paralyze you because they don't want you acting out your dreams. Your body doesn't want you to act out your dreams, so it'll paralyze you. So if you're a primate sleeping in the trees, then you're going to fall out if you're getting into REM sleep. So it's a very important evolutionary step for human beings to come out of the trees, sleep on the ground, also evolving fire so you can stay safe when you're sleeping on the ground. And... Um, that's also another reason why we have, um, like, uh, some people are night owls and some people are morning larks and we've got different chronotypes is because if we're all sleeping at the exact same time, they're kind of vulnerable. So we want some fire. We want some people who like staying up late and some people who like waking up early so that we can all stay safe as a social group because we've evolved to be social and we've evolved to use fire and we've evolved to have this REM sleep so that we can have our emotional therapist because we are social animals and being emotionally connected to people, being able to solve like 
complex social interactions and like he said, she said, she's mad at me, whatever, you know, all of that drama and stuff, that all becomes worse when you don't get your deep REM sleep every 90 minutes in your sleep cycle. And the longer you stay asleep in the night, you get more and more of that REM sleep and you get more and more of that therapy so you can wake up being the best version of yourself as a human being, as you have evolved. And birds do that too, which is super crazy, right? But birds are one of the most successful species, or not like class of animals on the planet. Air, ground, water, like all over the planet. I mean, there's birds freaking everywhere. When you can't see animals, you can always see a bird. You can always hear a bird. Birds are super successful. And it might be part of the reason that they work really well together. They have really interesting displays and they're so like creative and interesting and intelligent. They are doing that REM sleep as well. We can get that rapid eye movement sleep seeing in, in birds, right? Okay, so, um, random mutations is the only thing I really gotta like add on to this. Mutations that change the DNA during DNA replication of S phase, that is going to randomly change the letters in the DNA. DNA letters are A, T, C, and G. We call those nucleotides. And those letters are what are transcribed into mRNA and then translated by the ribosome into the particular amino acids. And you switch things up, and that's what makes the difference between having um, brown hair and red hair um, or being, you know, a bird with dark feathers versus light feathers or a, um, you know, a, a bird that, you know, like all the varieties and everything that we see on the planet, it all comes from these basic mutations when we replicate our DNA in S phase. S phase happens before mitosis. Every time you do mitosis, every time you do meiosis, you have to do S phase DNA replication beforehand because if you're making a new cell, both of the cells need DNA. Okay, if you're doing mitosis, both of the cells need two, like full set of DNA, diploid. If you're doing meiosis, those cells need a half a set of DNA. So we're still making more DNA. We're always gonna replicate our DNA. And so if DNA replication is not quite perfect, then we get these random mutations, changes in the letters of DNA sequence, which randomly changes your proteins, which gives us different physical appearances different traits, whether you are a bigger bird or a smaller bird, or whether you, um, you know, have larger calves and a displaced pelvis, or whether you have opposable thumbs or like these like slight changes, like how many wisdom teeth you have. There's all these changes that can occur, your blood type and, um, you know, whether you have webbed feet or whether you have multiple feet or lots of extra fingers or more knuckles or all of these little changes, those are just random protein changes. And we know the protein changes our skin color. It can change our um, proteins, change our blood type, proteins change um, birds skin or, you know, feather color or the amount of feathers that they have. The fact that they have feathers was a mutation long ago in a little weird kind of like scale on a dinosaur, you know, when you have dinosaurs that have their hard scales and then you get a little mutation, that scale is kind of like flappy and a little bit loose, like that dinosaur, you know, is that beneficial? Is that not beneficial? Well, if it is kind of feather like, then it kind of insulates them and keeps them nice and warm. And so that mutation happened to be beneficial in an environment if they're really cold. Well, they are cold blooded, right? And so that mutation gives them the ability to stay a little bit warm. And that's a benefit to have those like kind of scales that are like a little more feather like. And so now we're finding out more that most dinosaurs or a lot of dinosaurs had feathers. So our evolution of birds comes from these just random mutations that give birds these like feathers, right? And we're not talking about flying. We're not talking about like big old feathers. It's not like, you know, you have T-Rex just like having, you know, giving birth to an ostrich. You know, it's like, it just, it's not immediate like that. It have to be like small little changes. That's how evolution works. And you have these little random mutations in like the way that you make a scale and the color that you make the scale. And if that little mutation just changes the scale to be a little more feather-like and you're warmer, right? Then that's a benefit there. Now, if those feathers get slightly bigger, then you're warmer, that's, that's a benefit. That takes 
hundreds of thousands of years and lots of different cycles of reproduction and passing on the genes that are beneficial for that environment. And those adaptations, they're going to stay in the gene pool. Right? They're, if they're beneficial in the environment, that's an adaptation. And that's how we see the evolution of dinosaurs that have feathers to keep them warm. Then the feathers start to get longer because why? Well, random mutation. Some people are taller, some people are shorter. Some birds have longer feathers, some birds have, you know, less feathers. Some dinosaurs have longer feathers, some have shorter feathers. Some dinosaurs are big, some dinosaurs are small. It's all from these random mutations that change the proteins, which are your phenotype, your physical appearance. So then the next step is you're running and you are moving like this and you get some more propulsion so those feathers that allow the dinosaurs to keep warm, now they're allowing them to run faster in the smaller dinosaurs. So that's a benefit. Okay, so then if you have those feathers, then you have more babies because you are more adapted to your environment where running is really good for catching prey or avoiding being eaten. And then in smaller dinosaurs, spending time in trees. Well, you jump out of the tree and you got a bunch of feathers gliding, right? That's the next step. And again, this takes hundreds of thousands of years and slow changes to get slightly longer feathers in slightly smaller and the dinosaurs that spend time in trees. And then eventually we get flapping and then we get flying, right? And then the asteroid goes and smashes into the Gulf of Mexico 65 million years ago and it sends up a cloud of smoke and burn and fire and blocks out the sun and it's super cold. And then who has feathers and keep them warm? right? The dinosaurs with feathers, okay? The cold-blooded dinosaurs with feathers and the warm-blooded little rodents that have been waiting around for a long time. Thus, we enter the age of mammals 65 million years ago and the only dinosaurs that make it through are the ones with feathers, which is why we have so many birds on the planet today, okay? And that fire that knocks the dinosaurs out is exactly what we use as humans to cook our food, to stay safe, to be able to sleep safely on the ground. Cooking our food gives us more nutrients, like cooking eggs gives us, starts breaking down that food, breaking down those nutrients. We want them broken down so we can build them up the way that we want to in protein synthesis, in creating DNA, in DNA replication. We need to be able to build this up the way that we want. So if we can break that down with some fire initially, then when it enters our digestive system, we start to be able to use the enzymes the acid and the chewing, the mechanical digestion to break that stuff down more, absorb it into the bloodstream, right? And um, is there any other benefit to fire? Thanks for joining.